An honor and a pleasure to present a field which has developed over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, uh, due partly to the influence of uh, the CERN uh, scientific program, experimental program, as John Ellis uh, mentioned, and also to the influence of some of the CERN theorists. And I guess John is uh, one of the leading theorists who has convinced everybody else that. Uh, uh, particles play an important role in, uh, in the universe. So uh, it is often said uh, that CERN is a place where the conditions of a Big Bang are reproduced. So in a sense, you know, digging the LHC tunnel, one would be uh, trying to find the, the, the secrets of the, of the universe, and especially the very early universe close to a Big Bang. So let me try to uh, explain in more details what you know, this sort of uh, catch uh, sentence uh, is trying to, to, to express. So I'll show, uh, you know, we uh, physicists and astrophysicists like to show the Big Bang model, the evolution of the universe as we think uh, it happened. Uh, we have diagrams such as these. You have seen uh, similar diagrams in the previous talks. Uh, the present universe, uh, which would be on the uh, outer part of this diagram, is a very cold and almost empty universe. We don't see it in this room, but uh, if you go into space, uh, you'll find out it's very cold and almost empty. Uh, we have known for a long time that uh, the universe has been expanding, so that means that when we get back in time, uh, the universe was much denser, and because it was much denser, it was also much hotter. Uh, and if you go back in time uh, sufficiently, you might end up in uh, at least what is in uh, theoretical work, a singularity, which is known as a Big Bang. Whether a Big Bang exists or not is, uh, is, is, is another question, but at least uh, a, a time where the universe was very hot and very dense. I should warn you that this type of uh, diagram is very nice. Uh, on the other hand, it's also misleading. You might have the impression that the universe, uh, when it started at the Big Bang, was localized in, uh, in a very small part. Uh, well, this is wrong. The universe could have been infinite. The fact that the universe has been contracting when you go back in time, uh, or was stretching, if you want, when, when, uh, with time evolution, does not mean that the universe was, was very small when it started. Just think of an infinite line. If you stretch an infinite line, it remains infinite. If you uh, try to uh, unstretch it, it also remains infinite. So the universe could be infinite, uh, even though it has been expanding. So anyway, so uh, the universe, the early universe being hot and dense is a very good uh, laboratory for particle physics because this means that uh, when uh, in the early times, uh, instead of having uh, human beings, uh, you had particles and you had a sort of soup of particles where all the particles we have been discussing and maybe some of the particles we, we have not discovered yet at CERN or quarks, leptons and so on, all the, the, the zoo of particles that, we have, that have been discussed uh, were present at, at the level of particles and not uh, more involved sets of particles like, like we, we have today. So if I get back to uh, you know, what has been shown uh, several times, and so the early universe is really a sort of laboratory in some sense similar to uh, to CERN, uh, where you could study particle physics and uh, high energy physics. In the second part of my talk, I will also uh, show you that the universe is a place of a very violent phenomena, and here are some uh, you know, pictures, uh, nice pictures, I'll come back to in more details to these pictures, a source of, uh, a place of violent phenomena which are sources of very high energy particles. And so in the universe, out there you find, if you want, natural accelerators, cosmic accelerators, and I try to, to explain to you exactly wh wh what I mean by this and why this is interesting for our field. So if I try to compare CERN versus the universe, uh, well, there are pros and cons for the universe and for particle accelerators as far as understanding <coughs> fundamental physics. The pros uh, for particle accelerators as found at CERN are that 
You can prepare experiment and you can repeat experiment, which uh, of course uh, is important when you, when you do science. I mean, uh, you should be able to repeat uh, the experiment. The cons uh, are basically that the energy range is limited by technology, as we have seen, and unfortunately by funding also. It's exactly the opposite in the case of the universe. In the case of the universe, the energy available is enormous. As I said, when you get back to early times, uni the universe becomes hotter and hotter. So that means that higher and higher energies are available. And so uh, that means that you get for free the huge energy, uh, energies which can be uh, much larger than the ones available at CERN at this point. The cons is uh, basically that, uh, well, the experiment was made only once and we're not there at that time to prepare it. Uh, not quite. Uh, and the reason is that we're lucky that uh, the light has a finite speed. And as you know, because the light has finite speed, uh, a finite velocity, uh, we receive information at this time, at the present time, which dates back to early stages of the evolution of the universe. So even though we're not present, some people were present, well, not some people, some, uh, there were some witnesses of the early stages of the universe and the formation, because of the finiteness of the, velocity, um, the velocity of light, the information is only reaching us now. So even though we're not present, in a sense, we have some uh, witnesses uh, of uh, maybe what was not exactly what happened at the Big Bang, but uh, soon after. And I'll come back to that uh, in a second. So precisely, how does one study the history and the evolution of the universe? Well, you try to search for fingerprints of past years in the evolution of the universe, and I'll describe in a, in a second uh, what we call the cosmological microwave background, which is one of the you know, best uh, fingerprints of what happened at early times. We also try to understand the present content of the universe at large scale. Not so much what goes on in this room or what goes on on Earth or what goes on in our galaxy, but what goes on at a very large scale of the universe, because that is going to give us some uh, uh, information about the general evolution of the large-scale universe. So let me start uh, with one example, which is the cosmological microwave background. Well, when the universe started after the Big Bang, uh, for a long time it was completely opaque, uh, in the sense that uh, it was a very ionized medium, and so light would not go through. And so uh, this means that uh, uh, this is sometimes called the Dark Ages, for a long period of time, about 400,000 years, uh, the universe was completely opaque just because light would not go through, light would interact with this, uh, uh, with this ionized plasma. And then around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, there was what, what is called recombination, electrons and uh, ions recombined, electrons and protons recombined, and the universe became transparent. And uh, as you know, you just have to look at the sky on a good night. Uh, in a sense, the, the universe is transparent. And the very important thing is that light emitted around this period of time, 400 years, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, has been with us since. And the photons which, which make this light uh, have been traveling around uh, in the universe uh, without interacting much with, uh, with the rest of matter. And so this light has been you know, searched for, and uh, this, this is what, what is known as the cosmological microwave background. It was discovered by Pentheus and Wilson in the 60s. And uh, there is the energy, or if you want to temperature, which is associated with this, which is three Kelvin degrees, or if you want minus 270 uh, Celsius degrees. So uh, that's what I was saying. Nowadays, uh, the universe in this sense is extremely cold. The big adv advance uh, in this field came with, uh, in the 90s, with the Kobe satellite, uh, which whose purpose was to uh, look more carefully at the, this light, this cosmological microwave background. And what the Kobe satellite found was, and this was there were some theoretical arguments that one would find this at, at, at some level. Uh, if you look, when I'm saying that the temperature is, is minus 270 Celsius degrees, uh, 
there are some fluctuation of temperature. And what, this is exactly what the COVID satellite measured. Uh, of course, uh, this is a, a, a picture of the whole sky uh, represented on, the, on this ellipse. Uh, right in the middle, you see this red. This is light coming from the Milky Way, our galaxy. So uh, try to forget about this part here, which is just uh, light emitted from the stars of, uh, of our galaxy. The rest of the light, uh, you, well, the, the blue parts are uh, parts of the universe which are slightly colder than the free Kelvin. Uh, the red or, or yellow parts are parts which are a little uh, warmer than free Kelvin. And so you see there were some fluctuations of temperature. And so uh, because this light was coming back to these uh, very uh, old ages, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, so this gives us some extremely important information uh, about the universe you know, at that time. Well, there's been some improvement. Recently, in 2002, there were uh, a, a satellite, American satellite, was were sent uh, in order to study this in more detail. And so you see much more precise information in, in, different, wave, uh, in different wavelengths. And uh, as I was saying, you know, using these, this information about inosotropies of the cosmic microwave background, one is able to uh, get information uh, about our universe and its evolution. I'm not going to go through all these numbers just to show you that uh, there are lots of uh, uh, scientific information that one can extract from these maps of uh, fluctuations. And uh, I just, uh, uh, in this square here, you have uh, information which is more relevant to particle physics, like uh, the abundancy of some species, uh, you know, baryons, uh, dark matter and so on, even information about the mass of neutrinos. And so you see the interplay between uh, the study of the evolution of the universe, cosmology, and particle physics with, with uh, uh, you know, scientific results that you get from uh, uh, these imprints in the cosmological microwave background. Let me just give uh, one illustration uh, of uh, you know, the sort of information that one gets from, uh, from these maps. Uh, here is represented the, the temperature fluctuations with respect to the angle. So that means that uh, in these maps, you look at two points which uh, from the Earth are, uh, make uh, an angle uh, theta. So you look at two points which, uh, seen from here, uh, make an angle theta. So that means you look at temperature and isotropies, and so there is a difference of temperature between these two points. So you look at the difference of temperature versus the angle. And so you get this plot. Uh, which is in the sense of spectrum of temperature and isotropies. And for example, from the position of the first peak, you extract some very important information about the geometry of the universe and the energy density of the universe. The two are related through the theory of general relativity. So you find out that uh, the, energy density, the average of energy density of the universe is 10 to the minus 29 gram per cubic centimeter. And this is exactly what corresponds to a universe which is spatially flat. And so one of the results of uh, you know, these observations is that we believe that the universe is especially flat and not curved. This doesn't, I, I should be precise, space is flat. Space-time, of course, uh, remains curves, curved uh, as in the theory of general relativity. And so uh, we have to explain this, and uh, the explanation comes from, again, an interplay between astrophysics and, and particle physics. One believes, and this was first proposed by particle uh, theorists, that there was a period uh, of evolution of the universe, which is known as inflation, where the universe, if you want, had an explosive uh, expansion. And Okay, you, you might understand, you know, just with uh, that, if there's an explosive uh, uh, evolution, a very fast evolution of expansion of the universe, every, you know, curvature has been forgotten and the universe, you know, becomes really flat. And so we believe now, and, and as I just said, uh, you know, the first models came from, uh, you know, particle uh, theorists. Uh, and so we believe now that uh, we observe a universe which is, whose space is flat because uh, there was a, a very, uh, at the early, very early uh, period of uh, explosive in, uh, inflation uh, uh, expansion. 
So you see, when I say very early, if it's, uh, well, we, we still don't know, but, uh, uh, you know, typical number would be 10 to minus 35 seconds after the Big Bang. So just after the Big Bang. Okay, we'll know more about this uh, in a few years. A uh, new satellite will be launched by the uh, uh, European Space Agency, which is called Planck, and we hope to have, uh, you know, a map of the fluctuations which is more detailed than, uh, uh, you know, than the one uh, I just presented. And so this map should allow us to get even more uh, detailed results and to check some uh, of the uh, uh, hypotheses that we're making on the evolution of the universe. Now, so this is one, uh, you know, very interesting result. The second interesting result that uh, probably you have, you know, seen in, uh, in your, uh, your favorite newspapers because this has made the headlines of uh, many uh, newspapers uh, has come through the study of supernova explosions. Well, the idea is the following. Is the idea is to try to find in, in the universe what, what are known as standard candles. Uh, let me try to take an example. Just imagine that you want to buy a piece of land, but you're not allowed to, you're only allowed to see it uh, when at uh, at night, when the, with, on a dark night. One way you could try to look at the geometry of this uh, piece of land would be just to uh, stand in the middle and to send people around with candles. The same candle, everyone would have uh, the same standard candle. And just by looking at the position of the people and the amount of light that you get from each candle, you might be able to guess uh, exactly what is the geometry of, of that piece of land. So that's exactly what one is trying to do in, in the case of, uh, uh, of cosmology. The previous speakers have uh, mentioned uh, supernova explosions, which are very bright explosions, and there are some reasons to believe that, in a, in a sense, you know, these explosions, these supernovae, behave like standard candles. And so, uh, because they are very bright, uh, their light was emitted a long time ago. They are very distant, and so their light was emitted a long time ago. And so this way, by looking, using them as standard candles, you might uh, you know, get an idea about the geometry of, uh, of space-time. So uh, how does that go? Well, you just uh, take pictures of parts of the skies, and then you compare pictures uh, at different dates. And uh, sometimes uh, you see that, for example, this part here, this galaxy here, is suddenly, three weeks later, has become uh, much uh, brighter. And if you make a difference between these two pictures, then you find out that there was an explosion, and by studying you know, more carefully this, uh, you know, the signal that you get from, uh, from this light, uh, you find out that this was a supernova explosion. Okay, so here is uh, a, a star which will explode, and then you see these remnants are spraying around uh, heavy uh, elements. Well, these uh, supernova explosions are very important in order to produce heavy elements in, in the universe. Recently, it turns out that they were also important to uh, probe the geometry of space-time under the assumption that they behave like standard candles. And what people have, have uh, realized by studying the light of these supernovas, he has plotted light, if you want, what is known as magnitude, so that's uh, the, you know, the, the brightness versus the distance is that uh, they were somewhat, the very distant supernovae appeared to be somewhat less bright than in a standard expanding universe. The outcome of this discovery is that most probably the expansion of the universe, so we, are, we live in an expanding universe, but recently the expansion of the universe has accelerated. There has been an acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Now, if you are uh, particle theorists, then uh, the first thing you'll ask is, uh, okay, what caused this acceleration of the expansion? And uh, any form of normal form of matter or radiation tends to decelerate the expansion. So when one believes that there is, if there is only matter and radiation out there, the expansion of the universe should be decelerating slowly. So it's very surprising that certainly, uh, I mean, Recently, there's been acceleration of the expansion of the universe, and most probably this is a new form of energy which is responsible for this uh, recent acceleration, and that has been called uh, dark energy. And so, by combining this result with other results coming from the cosmic microwave background, one ends up with the, what is called known as the energetic budget of the universe. 
73%, well, around 70% of the total energy of the universe is in this form, which one calls dark energy because one does not really, what, uh, really know what it is. 23% is in the form of uh, dark matter that was uh, alluded to by the, the previous speakers, and only 4% is luminous matter. So that means that when you look at the skies uh, on, a, on a good night, you know, all the light that you receive comes from only 4%, oh, you don't even see, I mean, all visible sky, but imagine that uh, all the light that, all the matter that emits light from only 4% of the uh, total uh, universe, visible universe. Most of it is dark matter. Uh, well, some, uh, most of the matter is, is dark, so you don't see it. And uh, most of the constituents of the universe is this form of dark energy, which is a buzzword for uh, somehow our ignorance. Now, this, this has some deep connections with particle physics. Uh, dark energy is connected with a fundamental problem, uh, which is known as the vacuum energy problem. You know, uh, it was, vacuum was uh, is a rich notion in particle physics. The energy of vacuum is, 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 uh, is a big problem, which is associated with a con reconciliation between gravity and quantum theory. So I can hardly say, you know, say more about this, but this is a, a very central problem of our field. And uh, in the case of dark matter, as you know, uh, there are some very good candidates, particle physics candidates for dark matter, was, uh, you know, particles very weakly interacting, massive particles, which are called WIMPs. And uh, so that means that this part, although at this point, you know, I don't think there are any experiment, particles experiment looking for really uh, seriously for dark energy. At this point, there are some, uh, uh, you know, it's a very important part of our field to look experimentally for, you know, this particle phase candidates for, for dark matter. At accelerators, this was mentioned by John, I think, and also uh, by direct detection by going to, uh, you know, underground sites like mines or tunnels. Basically, it's uh, one of the particles, one of the dark matter particles uh, which make dark matter is interacting in the lab uh, with uh, uh, a proton and, uh, and, and you causes a recall of a proton that you try to study. And you have to be protected for cosmic rays uh, and so on, and so that's why you have to go to underground sites. 